physical inactivity is associated with a higher risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes, a study in 48,440 adult patients. And uh, most, most of the conclusion is discernible from that, from that title, but I will read to you just a couple of paragraphs from the introduction as well. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has identified risk factors for severe COVID-19, including advanced age, sex, male, and the presence of underlying comorbidities, such as diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. However, there are no data regarding the effect of regular physical activity on COVID-19 outcomes, even though a lack of physical activity is a well-documented underlying risk factor for multiple chronic diseases, including those associated with severe COVID-19. Uh, they then go on to say that the U.S. Physical Activity Guidelines uh, suggest that all American adults engage in 150 minutes of uh, activity every week, and that includes just a brisk walk actually counts towards this. So what is that, two and a half hours of um, you know, merely brisk walking or, or more uh, a week of physical activity counts as sort of meeting the guidelines. Next paragraph. During the pandemic, populations across the globe have been advised to stay home and avoid contact with individuals outside of one's household. Lockdowns and other measures that constrain travel have restricted access to gyms, parks, and other venues where people can be active. In the USA, education about the benefits of physical activity and advice to maintain or increase physical activity during the pandemic has been essentially absent. While pre-pandemic levels of physical activity were generally insufficient, pandemic control measures have likely had the unintended consequence of reducing physical activity even more. Indeed, early studies indicated a significant reduction of physical activity levels since the beginning of the pandemic. So that's that's the setup. And indeed, they uh, refer to a, another paper uh, that was published just last year, which does indeed find that while and this is all you know, it's self reports, and indeed, this paper itself is self reports of physical activity as well. But it's it's a way of self reporting that has been otherwise demonstrated to be um, pretty accurate. Um, we know that the People reporting on their levels of physical activity in the wake of lockdowns, many people are saying it's the same, um, but to the extent that people are saying it's it's different, uh, many more people are saying, yeah, I don't do as much as I did before than are saying I'm doing more than I was before, although there are some people in that, in that other state too. So if this is all true, and if physical activity has an effect on COVID-19 outcomes, then we've got, at the very least, yet another strong messaging problem. And indeed, uh, what this paper finds is, um, let's see, I'm not sure. Yeah, there was no, the graphics here aren't terrific. Um, so I'll just go to one more paragraph in the discussion. The magnitude of risk for all outcomes associated with being consistently inactive exceeded the odds of smoking and virtually all the chronic diseases studied in this analysis, indicating physical activity may play a crucial role as a risk factor for severe COVID-19 outcomes. So, you know, again, uh, like we've talked about before with regard to obesity, um, there are some there are some things that aren't even hidden, but that are hidden from conversation, that are hidden within in the media, that are not discussed, that you actually have control over, and even more than obesity, because you know some people once they have become obese, especially if that's due to developmental uh, intrusions into their lives, uh, over which they no longer have any control because now they're adults. Many people who are obese are actually going to have a very hard time getting unobese, and that's not to say that you don't have agency, but it's tough. But do you have an ability to get active? Does everyone, in fact, have an ability to simply walk briskly for two and a half hours a week? I, I say yes. And are there rare exceptions? And if you for don't, sure. it's an emergency that you develop that capacity, that you build up to it. Exactly. So I, I just wanted to add here, I don't think this paper discusses masks. It discusses activity. But I want to point out the absurdity in light of this of two things. One, you know, as we pointed out, uh, over the last couple of weeks, the idea that one has to wear a mask outside, which is a completely unscientific, it's an anti-scientific conclusion, but that conclusion portrays the world as 100% dangerous, where it is in fact 99% safe by virtue of the fact that it's 99% outdoors and the thing doesn't seem to spread outdoors. At least it hasn't learned that trick yet. But the, the fact of that misportrayal in conjunction with the idea that even outside, because it's all dangerous, you must wear a mask. That idea which reigned until a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. that means that to the extent that there was a question about should you go outside and be active, 
there were really two things marshalling against it. One was outside is dangerous. So yeah, you should probably go out and be active, but you know, it's, you're not escaping COVID mm -hmm. out there, even though you really are. Um, but the second thing is that it complicates being highly active, it right? Does. As bad as it is walking around with a mask, walk, running around with a mask or biking around with a mask or any of those things is awful. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it less likely that people will choose to do it. It's harder to do. Uh, and and in, in many places, it was actually forbidden for a while to, to just go outside at all. I mean, I think indeed one of the one of the studies we talked about early, which had this very strange result about dog walking being associated with um, with higher rates of COVID, and I think that was in Spain. Uh, after we talked about it, we heard from a number of people, actually this was, uh, if memory serves, in a city where a lot of people are living in high-rise apartments, and the one thing you're allowed to do is walk your dog, and in order to get your dog down to walk them, you have to be in these elevators, which are these tight, you know, enclosed spaces, and so probably this was, you know, the dog walkers were just simply the only people who were going up and down the elevators with any regularity, and that was likely to be the the issue. But anyway, there were a lot of people who just weren't even allowed to go outside. Right. Yeah. Weren't allowed to go outside. But imagine for a second that the actual adults had been looking at the actual evidence and making actual recommendations for how you actually avoid COVID. And they had concluded, you know what? Physical exercise is key. Obesity is a disaster. Uh, masks are potentially helpful, but not outdoors, and they impede the very behaviors that are most likely to make you well. Psychological well-being is increased by your going outside. So sit down, everybody. Here's the recommendation. Go outside. Spend as much time outside as you can. Go to the beach. Have a good time at the beach. You know, remind yourself what it is like to live without fear. If you had had that kind of recommendation, this would have been a very different pandemic. And instead, we were having officials close down beaches. Right. right. You know, close, close, limit, you know, you can't play tennis. I mean, there's still signs up. I think it's it's allowed now. But in Portland, I was taking pictures and showing them on air um, all through last summer. Yes, the swimming pools were closed. And I think at that point, we didn't fully know if maybe water transmission was possible. So I, I did not come down strongly against that. It felt like a, a tragedy for the children. But, um, but okay. But you know, sporting fields, no baseball, no basketball, no football, no tennis. Not uh, even for kids yeah. who, you know, kids who were immune by virtue of the fact that COVID does not seem highly capable of infecting or uh, damaging kids. They could have had sports and other activities outside. They engaged with each other. Engaged with each other. This So much of the harm here was needless. And there's something about it which – one just has the impression that there's a certain kind of authoritarian that likes spoiling people's fun. Mm -hmm. And so instead of embracing the counterintuitive facts about COVID and saying, you know what, COVID is a disease of indoors. It's the buildings that are dangerous. If you can figure out how to stay out of the buildings and really think very hard about how not to be in a car or if it's winter and you know, open the windows all the way and turn the heat up if it's winter. These sorts of pieces of advice about how to continue to live a normal life. We would, I think we'd in some ways be like a different people at this point because mm -hmm. we would all discover what it was like to be advised, actually, you know, the dangers in your house, but out there you're safe. And, you know, we might have- Well, I wouldn't say the danger's in your house. The danger's not in your house if you, you know, if, if you aren't letting lots of strangers come and, um, come and go. The danger is about being indoors among other people who might be infected. Well, I, I slightly disagree. I mean, okay. I, I think your, your caution is accurate, but a lot of what was true here was that once COVID got loose in a house, it tended to bounce around to anybody who could catch it. And Definitely, so, and actually, that you know that that mode of transmission is um, appears to be, if not the one of the most absolutely most dangerous things, is to have somebody bring COVID home. Yeah. So, which is you know, again another of the recommendations, uh, uh, you know, across the U.S. anyway, and I don't know how widespread this was outside of the U.S. was. If you get sick, given that we're so worried about ICU beds, what you do is you go home. <laughs> really? You just guaranteed a lot more people are going to get sick. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I just, I, we will never know, but I do wonder if this might not have been an enlightenment 
if instead of having fingers wagged at us for smiling outdoors at each other without a mask on or whatever it was, mm -hmm. right? If instead of being scolded for natural, the sense of relief that you should have had outdoors, for those of us who did experience it, right? We also experienced stigma for apparently not being decent, right? That was preposterous. That wasn't science. Well, and I mean, there was just across pretty much every domain that, that SARS-CoV-2 touched, there were simple rubrics that people felt empowered to use against other people to increase tribalism, to increase fear, to make them their own selves feel better. And just, you know, here's, here's an anecdote, which maybe I've mentioned before, but I was walking outside without a mask at one point, um, big broad path, and there was a woman coming towards me with a mask and she saw me and she saw someone way behind me um, and gestured at her and yelled in my general direction, thank you for wearing a mask. Like you are yelling, you are actually, if you are sick, the mask is not going to fully block when you're yelling and I'm not speaking because I'm actually interested in not getting you sick and I'm six more than six feet away from you and all of these things are true. And the idea that signaling to someone you don't know uh, about how awful I am is making you feel better, you know, can't, can't we all get a life at some level? Like, aren't we all capable of bringing something to the world that actually builds it up? Don't we all have some ability to create or to build or to heal or to communicate or to, to adventure, to discover, to analyze? Like, these are all productive, amazing activities. And I haven't begun to, you know, to exhaust all the possible verbs of productivity and, and, and and building that humans can involve themselves in and you know is critique a important part of the human endeavor it certainly is but anyone whose job entirely is about critique is not really doing the world a service yeah i mean i agree although um you know i sort of think of critique as the good version and criticism uh, but the, i but i this I, i'm not sure that most people will agree with me i'm not sure that anyone really will but i actually i've thought about this and i don't think that as much as critique and criticism are kind of flip sides with different connotations and critique is the positive and we know that critique is absolutely necessary in science and in art and in all, you know all endeavors if the only thing you engage in is critique i don't think you are doing the world the kind of service that you imagine you are oh yeah definitely um I guess I'm, uh, there's a sense, you know how there were teachers who had a really deep insight into human development and yes, they were part of the schools, but they also were sort of above that level of, uh, you know, rules and regs, right? Mm -hmm. they, they were flexible. They had nuance. They were about discretion. And then there were other teachers who were just all about the enforcement of the rules to the letter without any consideration of why the rules necessarily existed. Sure. I feel like we are all somehow being reduced to some schoolyard that is being ruled by the least imaginative, buzz-killing, rule-loving, authoritarian nanny teachers, and we just got to rebel, right? Yeah. The fact is there are places where the rules are essential and there are other places where somebody made them up because they wanted to tell you what to do. And well, and there's, I mean, I guess there's three categories, really. There's places where the rules are essential and they have to be the right rules. And then there are places where the rules aren't essential, but if you're going to have rules, they have to be the right rules. And then there are places where you don't need rules. And if there are rules at all, uh, you should be free to ignore them. Right. But in this case, right? <laughs> It is amazing to me that in some sense, the solution to a huge number of the problems created by COVID, problems that none of us invited, mm -hmm. right? A huge number of those problems were solved by going outside. I mean, even the social distance that this put between us didn't need to be maintained in the same way outside. That's right. Right. And, you know, if, you know, we have this saying uh, in the Pacific Northwest, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. You know, if you have to discover what you're going to have to do in order to be outside in the winter because there's a new wrinkle that makes it hard to be inside, right? Okay, that's the thing we should have advised people. Here's, you know, here's the the gentle slope to getting yourself active in cold weather in your environment or something like that. 
And, you know, I just, I, 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 I feel terrible for our species that we allowed <laughs> this to happen to us and not just, you know, the disease, but the way we botched the coping mechanism. We just screwed it up. Well, I, lo I love this framing of yours. You know, the idea that instead of this just debilitating debacle, worldwide debacle that we find ourselves in now, it actually could have been the opportunity for another enlightenment. Yeah. How tragic. Yeah. Utterly tragic. Yeah. Utterly tragic. And it's tragic, but you know what? There's a reason we focus on tragedy, and that's because you can learn from it. And that's right. You know, we don't know what the next thing that has the magnitude of COVID could be. It's hard to imagine such a thing, but you know what? Given the way disasters are going, the magnitude's going up. Something is going to be down the pike. Let's not screw it up next time. 